heard a patient humming a tune this morning, so I stepped into his room. I wondered what it was. I had heard it before, but just could not place it. So I asked. He was sitting up in his hospital bed, gazing out the west window. He slowly turned and said, I can't believe you don't know this. That, my dear, is Bye Bye Blackbird. Well, the only music I'll have you know, and I know them all, are the brass and vocal hymns, songs and spirituals of the Salvation Army. said that music was a means to an end. It should attract people, but it had to speak the message of salvation to their hearts. I quite liked that tune of the blackbird. And you know, William Booth was no stupid man. He also said he didn't care whether the music was secular or sacred. I quite like robbing the devil of his choicest tunes, he declared. Music is about the best commodity he possesses. It's like taking the enemy's guns and using them against him. This is 1937, Salvation Army Grace Hospital, Windsor, Ontario, the Dominion of Canada. <laughs> presided, and it was all about the garden party and the committees that were elected. The date was set for June 25th. 
and there will be the usual booth set up and tea served on the lawn. And if you were wondering what to do with Aunt Matilda's Christmas gift, don't worry anymore. Just send it to us. It might prove to be the thing to catch someone else's Aunt Matilda's eye. The final alumni meeting was held and it was a very busy session. It was all about the garden party and the children's alumni played a prominent part and 2,000 letters of invitation were sent to the Grace Mothers. This was a gigantic task, necessitating a thorough search through all the yellow and musty files, then verifying addresses, each street number of which has changed in Windsor during the past year. It was quite a puzzle with the old originals, deciding which of the three Mary Browns or Lizzie Smiths was the one who had been there. But so far we haven't had any slander suits for inviting the wrong said Mary Brown or Lizzie Smith. True enough, of course, they are all misses, but dare not think of the chagrin and horror, not to mention exclamation to a husband by a spouse of an unknown child in a staid little home for two. Tricky, isn't it? Miss Clares Connor handled the whole thing, and she wrote to the Grace Mothers. Last year on June 26, for the first time ever, we introduced the baby alumni, which proved to be a very popular feature. The baby alumni is composed of all the babies born at this hospital. As the hospital has been open since 1920, they will range from teenagers to little infants. And there will be races with prizes, a fish pond, pony rides, and tea served on the lawn. And wouldn't you know it, last year Mary Grace Morton McLean showed up. She was the first baby ever to be born at Grace. February 21st, 1920. Dr. James Gow was the physician in the delivery room. Grace, or Mary as she prefers, attended Prince Edward Public School and Cameron Avenue Public. Now she's at Patterson Collegiate. Last year, I don't think there was ever such a large a collection of children gathered together in one place in this locality. And they ranged in ages and sizes and fat ones, skinny ones, little babies and sophisticated teenagers. Beautifully dressed children though. And this year, there will be music on the lawn, sparkling brass instruments, and sounds of tambourines. And yes, it might disturb some of the little ones.
am the Echoist. The mystery writer spinning tales of this grand old place here at Crawford and London Street. Tapping out the news and gossiping to all those schooled, capped, and sent off to tend to the sick and the ailing. I am their voice. I am the reminder of all the good we try to instill in the young minds of these aspiring nurses. I was their night supervisor, their science teacher, and the one who warned them at every step of the way. I am the echoist. My real name is Captain Gladys Barker. I have just heard from Captain Winifred Kern. She was in our 1937 class. She was our obstetrical floor supervisor. We gave her a farewell party before she set sail July 22nd for South Africa. I'm just hearing from Winnie, writing to me, seasick and homesick, and a little bit lonely and weary. Maybe wondering if she made a mistake in going so far away. <laughs> but not at all unhappy about choosing South Africa over India. Now she easily could have been here all along in the shiny corridors at Grace Hospital. She sadly missed the sprucing up of the outside that we did, painting it a splendid sandstone color. A very pleasant change from the browns and the greens. Dear Echoist, September 1938. I've arrived safely at my destination. I felt very sick before getting to Cape Town. Talk about cape rollers. The waves were 30 feet high. Our boat just sat on the side of the waves. Deck chairs were sliding and so were we. Many passengers thought our boat was going to turn on her side, but we learned that had we reached the other side of the coast earlier, the waves there were 50 feet high. <sighs> the day we reached Durban, I thought I was going to be blown overboard. It was so windy and so very cold. The first two days, I could not get warm. This is our spring here. The wind blows and the dust blows at a furious rate. I am here on missionary work. We are absolutely secluded from everywhere. The closest village is seven miles away. We are on a mountainside and on a native reserve, and this is a very busy spot. It does not matter which way you look, there are hills. I've never seen so many hills or mountains until I first caught sight of the African shoreline. They are everywhere and most beautiful. From where I am, I can see the Indian Ocean about 24 miles away. We are so high up, so we can see it. I had a lovely welcome meeting last Sunday. The hall was about the size of Walkerville, and it was packed. They sing the same songs as we do, and the music is not hard to follow, but I cannot even begin to pronounce some of the words yet. No other white people are allowed to come here. It is just a divisional commander, his wife, their two children, and myself. I'm in charge of the hospital under the divisional commander. I have a native girl to help, but I have to be nurse, doctor, and dentist. Sometimes it feels as though we are all alone and not a soul around as far as the eye can see. But we are actually surrounded by thousands of Zulus. And the Zulus have no secrets. Anything that happens is made known to the whole community. Oh, and if a single girl gets into trouble, she tells her father or elder brother all about it. And he, in turn, tells the entire community. And on the day the baby arrives, the whole family is called to witness the arrival. Even the last born child who may be toddling about. Oh, I often think of the Windsor Hospital and of the folks I've left behind, but I really am called to work among these people.
How stupid of me. I actually sent the echoes addressed to Mr. R. Cross, Emo, Ontario. R. Cross? Red Cross. It was actually intended for Verna Card, who works in an outpost in Rainy River District. I just received this letter from Mary Smith of the 1936 class, and she got a note from Verna wondering why they hadn't heard from any of us here. I wrote to Verna right away, and I told her I am so sorry about that. Perhaps the echoes are still at the post office under this phantom gentleman's name. Verna Card was in our first graduating class of 1923. Under the keen eye and supervision of Major Ravina Macaulay, and incidentally in 1929, she was named the first president of the Grace Alumni. I remember when Verna first found work out north in a Red Cross outpost in Maynooth, in Hastings, in northern Ontario. I remember when she wrote to us from the hospital back in the spring of 1936. She didn't stay long. She came back the following March, but a year later, she was headed north again to an outpost in the shores of Rainy River, in Emo, in northwestern Ontario. And I was sending her letters that never arrived. Even the post office couldn't find this Mr. R. Cross. Dear Miss Smith, my thoughts are straying to Windsor this evening, and the spirit moved me to write. It feels like ages since I've been there, but it's only been a little better than a year. I don't get any news from Windsor. I don't get the echoes any longer. As you can see, I've joined the Red Cross once more. They asked another nurse and myself to come north and open an outpost. Perhaps you'll recall that last Thanksgiving, 14 people lost their lives in a forest fire. They are buried in Emo. The outpost was badly needed. It looks dreadful to see miles of burned timber and the muskeg is still burning. From here to Fort Francis, it is burning in several places. And it does look strange to see clouds of smoke rising from fields of snow. When we arrived, I called on the doctor and had dinner at his place. Then he brought us over here and, oh, what a mess. The place we're gonna work out of was piled high with beds, bedding, supplies, and how we did work to get it ready for the opening on December 27th. We got it done, a seven bed hospital with a fairly well equipped OR. The doctor is very nice to work with and I am his assistant. He does everything in surgery. We did a few tonsils and a circumcision in the first few days. But our first major surgery was a herniotomy. A man of 63 and he was sprinting home, feeling like an 18 year old. Then we did uh, an appendix, doing all with a spinal. And then there was this sweet lady of 35 years. She had no fewer than three tumors in her abdomen. We just sewed her back up, it was so sad. We couldn't do anything more. Now, I, I have to admit, I do love assisting with an operation. That isn't bloodthirsty, is it? When it's helping so many folks in an isolated district. Just this morning, we had two babies delivered, 10 minutes apart. Our outpost is on the shores of Rainy River and it must be lovely in the summer. I don't know how long I'll be here as the Red Cross moves their nurses around from outpost to outpost in Rainy River. Another from Winnie, June 1st, 1939. She's had a pretty busy month in May. Three maternity cases, one abortion, one fracture, and one victim of a fight. But the maternity cases are different. Dear Echoist, 
The Zulus are very hard on their maternity cases. They only bring them to the hospital when something goes wrong. They sit on their patient and shake her and do all kinds of things to make the baby come out. I had a patient last Wednesday who was in labor for a day and a half. Her mother brought her to the hospital, but the child was stillborn. Right away, her mother started scolding her and telling her it was her fault and she must have done something to kill the baby. I tried explaining why the child had died, but it was of no use. The mother insisted they go home right away. There's no use staying in a hospital if there isn't going to be any baby. All of this happened before the placenta came. When that happened, I left my patient to go for breakfast. My girl told me as soon as I turned my back, her mother made her stand up on the floor to see if she could walk. I returned from breakfast, and her mother was insistent on taking her home, so I told her to get some men from the village to carry her home on a stretcher. The poor girl will likely be treated as worse than a dog now, all because her firstborn child died. My girl told me it would not matter to the husband if the girl did die, for he could easily get another wife. It actually does not seem real. The Great War was different. 
This in some ways matters more, I guess. But I am sure when the wounded start coming back, we will feel its very pulse and weight and tragedy. And we will care for them. And the student nurses will be giving a rude awakening. Even now, Dr. Arby Robson's never-ending refrain to them is that they ought to begin believing in the whole idea of making a difference, striving to accomplish something, doing something important. Mind you, some of the graduates are already filing for work overseas. Their letters from Europe keep us closer to the news than the Windsor Daily Star. I have just heard from Flora Higdon, now McCammond. She set sail for England right after graduation in 1935 to be married and do some postgraduate work. But when her husband, Dr. Ernest McCammon, suddenly fell ill, they wound up remaining in Britain, living right outside of London. War landed right on their doorstep. Now her husband is one out of seven surgeons in a 1,600-bed hospital. And Flora is there, too. She's putting to good use what she learned here, but also learning a whole lot more. Dear Echorist, May 1941. Every time the Echos arrive, and they come with unfailing regularity, Hitler's U-boats notwithstanding, I feel I want to send off a word of greeting and news to all the friends this worthy little paper represents. But just to find the time to do so has been the problem the past few months. I embrace this opportunity of bringing healing and comfort and encouragement to the brave people whose little homes, tiny gardens, and quiet suburban streets are the front line in the Battle of Britain. I look after a men's surgical ward, and my patients are mostly air raid casualties and soldiers. There are 28 beds on my ward, and they are always full. Sometimes, even in the middle of the night, we have to evacuate those who have got past the acute stage of our, their illness to the convalescent wards in order to make room for others in greater need. Those who have just been brought in from first aid posts, bombed out houses, or other hospitals which have been damaged. The shortage of nurses is acute, and often I've been left absolutely all alone to do everything for my men for several hours at a time. My busiest afternoon, I think, was when I suddenly found myself with six patients going to the OR, one right after the other. I was alone, the only nurse on duty from 1.30 to 4.30, and had to prepare the men, give each their preoperative drug on time, dispatch them to the OR, look after them once they've returned to the ward, make their beds while they were gone, and in addition, look after the rest of the ward, serve the tea, all of which is prepared and made in the ward kitchen, even to the cutting of bread, and then begin the afternoon's washings and bed makings. I managed somehow. The worst was the one night at midnight when incendiaries crashed into the maternity block, sending this 60-bed building into chaos and destruction. For the rest of the night, rescue squads, doctors, nurses, and men from the surrounding houses worked at clearing the debris, getting the patients out first, and then after a long time, someone thought of the nurses and the residents and went to their assistance. Imagine the delight of everyone when it was found that not one patient had been killed, and not one of the 50 babies. Only one had received a slight scratch. As for my men's ward, of the 18 windows, only two panes of glass remained intact. I shall always remember that night as one of the busiest, the coldest, and one of the happiest I'd ever spent. It was so good to be alive and uninjured, to be able to look after those who were ill, to keep everyone warm, blankets, hot water bottles, and hot drinks were the order of the day. Working hard kept us from freezing, with 17 window frames quite devoid of glass. The atmosphere inside was little different than that of the great outdoors, where it was a bitter, really cold day. By blackout time, most of the glass and plaster had been cleared out of the ward, and most of the windows filled in with paper, cardboard, etc. 
And our water supply was nearly normal, but we had no gas for several days. It's surprising how well we got along, though. We needed milk, gruel, soup, boiled eggs, and instrument sterilizers. And our water sterilizer actually supplied us with the necessary boiling fluid for tea. Well, such is life in a wartime hospital. I'm finding it most interesting and thrilling. Wouldn't you like to join me? There's also this note from Mary Ellis from Churchill Hospital in Hoodington, Oxford. I was on duty three or four times a day washing dishes and trying to feed 30 of us out of almost nothing but potatoes and rice. We could not get maids or cooks. We were all doctors and nurses, and we had our meals at one end of the dining room. It was very cold. We ate and slept in our top coats and blankets. I had two hot water bottles and was still cold. We have eight wards open now, and 30 patients in each, and very short of nurses, or sisters as we are called. The nurses here are very good indeed and can do almost anything. They are all English and a good bunch. One is Lady G. Drummond, and one or two of the others are honorable something or other, doing their bit for England. Oh, how wonderful everyone here is. They will do anything to help win this war, as win we must. We were told yesterday we are going to have a lean winter, and we have to tighten our belts. <laughs> I have lost seven pounds already. I can see a size 11 dress fitting me well when I get home. Oh, what I could do with a steak right now. Or some nice chicken. It is now 1942, and the letters keep arriving from Europe. Doris White of the 1931 class, she and Edna Schmidt, another nurse, they just arrived in England. After leaving Windsor, they trained in Toronto at one of its military hospitals with 250 patients, some of whom were German prisoners. They wrote, Dear Echoist, I had my first glimpse of a German. Very cute. They go out with the guards every day and play ball. We are not allowed to look after them until we are in uniform. But we can still look at them. And we do all the time. Interesting. I'm sure they didn't mean that. Doris, by the way, meticulously detailed what a nurse has to bring with her when she goes to war. It costs more than $400. One great coat. One spring coat. One trench coat. One recreation suit. Six, six nurses, nurses uniforms. uniforms. Two blue suits uh, to wear for street. Two blue wool uniforms for street. One cape. Two hats. Twelve aprons. One brown leather belt. Three brown shoes. One pair of rubbers. One pair of galoshes. One pair of rubber boots. Twelve pairs of stockings. Brown. Four pairs of gloves. Brown and white kid for dress. Sixteen, Sixteen pairs, pairs of collars and cuffs. cuffs. Two pairs of slacks to wear on the boat. Three scarves. One umbrella. One steamer trunk. 12 by 24 by 36. One duffel bag. One steamer rug. Lots, Lots of, of warm, warm woolen, woolen undies. undies. And many other smaller things. Soap. Starch. Flashlights. Lemons for nausea. Pins of all kinds. By the way, it was good to hear from Gertie Sutherland. Gertrude Sutherland was one of our earlier graduates from the 1929 class. I remember how she was boasting about how she was so well prepared but as she was crossing the English Channel, you could hear her complaining all the way back to Crawford in London. She could barely manage those miserable hours in the rough sea. And that was shortly after June 6, 1944, landing at Juno Beach. Dear Echoist, we were taken off on landing barges. This is quite thrilling as you go through over the side of the boat, through a chute, complete with full pack. Not the, it's, no light, load. it's no light load, I can assure you. 
After a rough ride, we landed on the beach. And all the things I heard about it are quite true. Only after you have plowed through it, almost up to your knees, almost slept in it, and I'm sure, ate it, only then you can really appreciate it. We were taken to a marshalling area. We had to wait several hours before once again being boarded up on trucks and taken through a much beaten and battered countryside to a beautiful green cow pasture where we spent several weeks. We spent days in our combat clothing, never taking anything off. We ate K rations, quite good, but a good thick steak would have been much more tempting. Water was rationed, and so when we washed face and hand, we used our helmets. One thing that was very amusing was our John, an eight-holer, situated in the most beautiful apple orchard you could have ever seen. Nothing but God's blue sky above you. This was the local gossiping spot for us all, except when it was raining. Then, 12 of us then were taken by train to this hospital only seven miles from Paris. It is a beautiful place, originally a hospital only six years old. Very modern and at present very, very busy. We passed through the city of Paris uh, from the station by ambulance. It is a beautiful, beautiful place and what I've seen of it is quite lovely. I spotted the Eiffel Tower and when I passed through the Arc de Triomphe, it was all so thrilling. With all the poverty and destruction we saw coming through the countryside on the train, incidentally a hospital train, one wonders why this great city was spared. The village near the hospital was very quaint and uh, the countryside was very lovely, but the hospital was heated, but in our quarters there is no heat, very little hot water. At present, I'm sitting down in bed with a warm hot water bottle at my feet encased in two woolen socks and flannel pajamas on, two sweaters, and tucked in between layers of blankets. My hands are frozen and blue from cold. So before conditions worsen, I'm afraid I should say au revoir to you all. We also hear from our doctors, Dr. F.S. Bryan, now a major with the Canadian Army. He wrote to us from the Canadian General Hospital number 10, and it is readily evident from his tone that he missed the old place here. And from what I read in his letter right before Christmas 1944, I can actually visualize him in those first six weeks in Normandy, frantically racing from one operating room to another. Dear Echoist, on more than one occasion, we admitted sufficient patients to fill all the general hospital beds in Windsor in a single afternoon. Our operating tents worked on a 24-hour basis for weeks. Sleep was a precious commodity. It was a weird experience at 3 a.m. to be crawling along in the dark <clears throat> between tents, arms loaded with bottles of blood or plasma on the way to someone who had suddenly gone flat. With the darkness of the night punctuated by flashes and thunder of the guns, or lit up by myriads of tracer shells, as the anti-aircraft batteries lit up on the jerry planes as they passed overhead. One wears a steel helmet in these days, often in bed, for what goes up from guns always comes down and the shrapnel whistles down like hail and penetrates the canvas of a tent like tissue paper. In such circumstances, a sense of humor is an invaluable asset, and many a laugh I had in the resuscitation tent where I was physician, nurse, orderly, and father 
on countless occasions. It is amazing what young lads in their prime and trained to a high level of physical efficiency can tolerate and survive. It was trying when one's own friends turned up, as they occasionally did. Winnie posted again from a Matakulu Zulu land, worried about the war in Europe and how long she might be confined to living in South Africa. I mean, she is so far away and so isolated from what's going on that it must seem surreal to her being so far away. Dear Echoist, I haven't forgotten you. I've received all the echoes from September to January. I won't recognize the hospital when I return. If the war ever ceases, 
If it does not, I will stay put. We have experienced somewhat of a drought here. The crops have failed, and in some parts the people are starving. About two weeks ago, many came begging for a prayer meeting for rain. About 200 gathered on top of one of the hills, and they prayed for rain. And that night, it poured. But the next morning, by 8 a.m., it was as dry as it had ever been. Yet, it gave them all hope that it had rained at all. That Friday, it rained again, and on and off again yesterday, and it doesn't look to be over yet. Oh, I do hope the drought has ended. We've also experienced an epidemic of dysentery here. One man died of it. And the people here are so superstitious, they believe his ghost invades the hospital every night. Some have even seen it. They've also talked about seeing lights coming up from the grave. I believe this to be true, for I remember learning about the Great War in school. Our teacher told us that in Flanders, where the dead were buried, light was seen coming up from the graves. This was because bodies were not properly embalmed, and they were buried slightly below the surface. The light was due to the phosphorus, which escapes. I believe this is what's happening here, but the people are so superstitious, they believe his ghost walks the hospital every night. Some have even heard cups and saucers rattling in the darkness. My assistant tells me that every patient has said that this man has visited them. So I asked, well, how come he hasn't come to visit me, for it was I who looked after him? And she said, oh, he doesn't know where you sleep. <laughs>
The letters I received from Winnie are so alarming. In March 1943, she was so distraught over the birth of a new baby because the old grandmother scrounged a tin and placed something that might resemble snuff or incense to burn in it. As she did this, she also placed the heated item on the umbilical cord as soon as it was cut. It is believed that this will chase all the evil spirits of the disease away. Winnie is such an accepting person. I mean, she might as well have thrown out the nursing book from Windsor's Grace Hospital, because in no way does she dismiss such practices of dealing with illnesses. One procedure in particular intrigued her. The treatment for a headache. It is said that if one has a headache, somehow a winged insect has made its way to burrow within the skull. And when that insect gets angry, it results in a throbbing headache. The same with abdominal pains. The cure for the headache, however, was setting a plate of burning medicine on the head of the afflicted one and watching carefully because you might spot the creature creep out and fly away. It is May 7th, 1945, and we swarmed the radios this morning listening to the news. The Germans had surrendered. And today it was also a day of celebration for a different reason. And I had to practically be pulled away from listening to the news because today 22 nurses were celebrating their graduation in our nursing program. <laughs> Today, the graduation exercises will be held at Walkerville Collegiate. Brigadier Brett had already anticipated that peace would come to Europe. We had been hearing about it every day in the Windsor Daily Star. So she prepared a special service of gratitude, summoning all the orderlies, medical staff, and nurses to the hospital's lecture hall. She prepared fancy programs with red, white, and blue, ribbons attached so participants could wear these on their lapels. The British and the Union Jack were placed at the front of the hall and a big flag was hoisted outside of the hospital building. Ruth L. Dunn was our valedictorian. She was entirely candid in her recollections of schooling here at Grace. And she told the story about trying to feed a patient cherries. But somehow, Unknowingly, I put the woman's dentures in upside down. Or the time she was assisting in the operating room for a patient who was having their tonsils removed. The doctor gave her a cup with water and told her to hold it still. She let the cup fall to the floor when the doctor went to wash his instrument in it. But I thought water was for drinking. The soldiers have started coming back. 
And as far as we are concerned, it is still a wartime rush in the hospitals. All the rolling stock is out and everything on wheels is put into use. In the meantime, we are getting extra new beds and all of the old, worn out ones are being shuttled back and forth from Windsor bedding. And I think all the nurses who trained during the wartime should receive a special medal denoting the fact, along with their graduation pins. This is 1949. The Liberals have been re-elected and Paul Martin is still our very best friend. It's good to have the health minister living nearby, and there's not a day that goes by that we don't hear from him. Mr. Martin telephones long distance from Ottawa before the house sits, and when he's in town, he pops by the hospital, making rounds like the doctors, shaking hands and smiling, and never once taking off his top coat. He has been good to us. We have been promised the money to build a new nurse's residence. And finally, the nurses can pack up and move out of that smattering collection of houses surrounded in the neighborhood, scattering the hospital. It's time for a change. <laughs> Some of these houses have one bathroom for 12 girls. We hear the whining all the time. One in the tub, one on the toilet, one at the sink slapping on lipstick, and three or four idling outside. It's time for a change. We hear it. We hear it. And so does the Honorable Paul Martin. The hospital is bulging at the seams. 
A tornado put a strain on the whole city a few years ago. And when the victims began to pour in this pitiful burden of suffering humanity, the hospital was mobilized and every doctor in the city telephoning and offering to come in and help. And the student nurses suddenly had to step up and become real nurses. The landscape was ripped from its moorings. 75 homes gone in seconds. Box cars flying about like toys. And that evening, in the Windsor Daily Star, as Bob Haley wrote from his hospital bed, heroes were a dime a dozen. Helen Palmer was there, barely a year from graduating. I remember her, and I hear from her all the way from India. She left to India after graduation, called to missionary work. A spunky little nurse with her head in the clouds and her feet on the ground. She was there that day, tending to a little boy with a badly lacerated leg and working in the terrible darkness when the power went out at the hospital. Now she's in India, learning all that she can there and carrying all that she has learned here. So did Verna. I cannot believe how Verna continues to vanish further into the hinterland. So dedicated is she. So much of her life has been spent in the North. Here it is, April 1950, and Verna is posting a letter from Big Trout Lake, an OG Cree reserve about 580 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. Dear Major Barker, I am 300 air miles from a post office. Sue Lookout, I'm in charge of a nursing station. It is the Canadian government's most northerly nursing station, and I am here for the purpose of teaching public health to the Cree. I'm 135 miles west of Hudson's Bay. My territory is quite extensive. 60 miles west to Bearskin Lake, 50 miles south to Big Beaver House. The post is an island on Big Trout Lake. There are eight of us whites, myself, staff maintenance man, and his wife housekeeper, uh, the Hudson Bay doctor, and the Department of Transport Weather Station staff. There's an Anglican missionary who is married to a Cree, and just now I am struggling with the Cree language. I travel by dog team, and a while back I received a call from a camp 25 miles away about a boy who had severed an artery in his foot while out on the trap line on Tuesday. It was too late to leave that day, so we left early the next morning. I watched the sunrise far out on the trail. It was lovely on the trail, winding in and out of spruce and pine woods across lakes and down rivers. It took us an hour to cross one lake. The weather was sharp but not too cold, and I was snugly wrapped in an eiderdown robe on a toboggan. We got to the camp in about five hours, and I found that the Indians had stopped the hemorrhage by packing the nasty wound with willow bark and rabbit hair, and I could see the artery pulsing through the clot, so only packed it with sulfa powder and gave the boy penicillin. I slept that night in my robe on the floor of a camp in the pine grove, and the trees whispering to me all night. I like to think it was the love of our Heavenly Father who loves the children of the North Woods. I hired a dog team in the morning and brought the boy back to the station. I wired Sue Lookout and they sent a plane. We were weather bound, so the boy did not get there till the next day. He is okay, though, and will be able to walk again by summertime. I wrote her back, reassuring her that somehow she made the North sound so romantic. Trails and trees and plains and dog teams.
quite some time. Her letter arrived just the other day. They came from the Mission House, Madhuri Shamparan, Bihar, North India. What a challenge for her. She is responsible for the mission's maternal child care and leprosy clinics. This was the same community where Mahatma Gandhi had been imprisoned. Helen's co-workers had known him when he was there. Helen seems entirely content and so resolute in caring for the unfortunate. Dear Echoist, May 23rd, 1958. We are in the hot weather now, and one lives in a bath of perspiration most of the day. The first week in May was very busy, as so many of them came down with the flu. Yesterday, was the leper day for the women. One poor old woman came, very ill indeed. She's been coming regularly for about a year and has had a flare up. She came with a very swollen foot caused by an ulcer, full of maggots and the stench oh, was terrific. My heart went out to her as I dressed her foot and I spoke to her of one who could bring comfort in love. She is very old and says she is dying. It was so nice to hear from Helen. We sent her a small monetary gift. I won't say how much. To help with the mission, she seemed so pleased. Dear Egoist, it is a real joy to be remembered by you each year. We had a lovely Christmas. It began at 4.20 a.m. when we were awakened by sweet strains of music. <laughs> a 16-year-old lad was standing on the veranda singing Christmas carols. At 4.45 a.m., our own orphan girls came singing carols, including a four- and five-year-old. It's quite cold at that time of morning, too. <laughs> After breakfast, the girls, about 35 of them, came to open their presents. What a noise as they unwrapped their gifts and showed them to others. At 10 a.m., we had our church service, and at 12 noon, the whole church ate together. We had curried goat meat and rice. We ate off a banana leaf and used our fingers. <laughs> the cups were earthenware, the type that is used once and then thrown away and broken, so there was very little cleanup to do. Saturday is leprosy clinic day, and in spite of trying to arrange no patients on Christmas day, <laughs> 75 turned up. <laughs> Last Tuesday, at our free leprosy clinic, we gave out rice, lentils, and heavy cotton wraps to 150 very poor patients. 
Many of these have been turned out of their homes, and they just sleep out under the trees. We have over 2,000 leprosy patients coming to the outpatient clinic, and one-tenth of these is in dire straits, and many have become beggars. Yes, I am the echoist. But it is time to step down. Let someone else take this on. I have been tapping away at this big underwood. My words each month fill up every bit of this space. On these long sleeve stencil sheets for the Gestetner, hoping to never strike the wrong key because it's annoying trying to fix it. When I'm done, I slip them onto the machine, fastening them meticulously into place, inking the wells, and start the run. Each echo's ready to be shipped out to the world at large, to the graduates. Remember one of ours, <laughs> Margaret Finch, in her valedictory address. A student nurse is truth in a starched uniform. Circles under her eyes, wisdom and penicillin in her hair. The future with a diamond on her finger. A student nurse has the appetite of a horse, the digestion of an ulcer patient, the energy of a vitamin pill, the lungs of a switchboard operator, the imagination of a medical student, the sharpness of a scalpel, and when she gives pills, she has five thumbs on each hand. No one is so early to rise or late to bed. No one gets so much out of one pocket. A pair of scissors, safety pins, one pencil, lipstick, powder, comb, Kleenex, a catheter clip, and the narcotic key. This is Windsor, Ontario, and Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, May 5th, 2020. Dear Mom, I miss you. I wish the border would open up so I could see you. It's getting so bad here. We ran out of surgical masks, so now we are being asked to use the same one sanitized three times over before getting a new one. We've run out of isolation gowns, so we're using plastic sheets. I think most of the time I'm fine. And then I start crying over a stupid commercial or something, and part of me knows I'm not fine. So many black people are dying in my unit. And I wonder about the injustice of this all the time. I'm so discouraged, and I can't escape the sadness. My co-worker had a miscarriage, and she keeps working because we're so short-staffed, and she can't get the procedure in to get the baby out for three weeks. My other co-worker's ex-husband is using COVID to keep her children away from her. I ha she hasn't seen her kids for almost three months. I wonder how much damage this is being done to families. And for
for how many people this will be the tragedy of their lives. Room three fell at home. His wife died two days ago in her nursing home, and he was devastated that he died that she died alone. They were married for 75 years. Room 11 is 40. Surely she should have gone a long time ago, but her mother, her mother just could not let her go. You see, she already lost her son and his fiance this week. She can't lose her entire family, she says. Room nine is 40, and he just came to us. He has a wife and four kids, and they're all arguing over who gets to be his last visitor. Room 11, he just died. We worked on him for 30 minutes. As we did CPR, his chest tattoos burned into my mind. His children's name, his wife's on his arm, and the phrase, and the phrase, family above all else, across his chest. His wife screamed, and she told me that they have four children, all under 10, and what's she gonna do without him? And I think the rest of my heart broke, which is good because I'm numb now. The neighborhood got together and had a parade around the hospital, cheering us on, honking their horns, and telling us we were their heroes. I don't feel like a hero. I feel sad and helpless. I hope this really makes people grateful for each other. And I hope this brings people together. Huh. I guess that's something positive that I didn't realize I still had. Oh. I miss you, Mom. Nikki Hillis Walters. March 11, 2020, marks the day when our greatest fear as healthcare workers officially became a reality. I was directed to be one of the nurses who would be testing our community in the, in the first COVID assessment and testing center, which was transformed overnight. I watched as a line started to form outside the doors. The 12 hour shifts felt so terribly long as we were covered head to toe in our protective gear. I remember how dry my mouth became under my mask, wondering if it was safe to take it off to take a sip of water. I decided not to take that risk. Life at home became challenging as well, as I feared putting my loved ones at risk. I isolated within my own home from my family while some of my coworkers moved into trailers in their driveways and some into hotels to keep their families safe. We were living in fear, isolated in our thoughts. At the time, I didn't realize that this was only the beginning. Shortly after, we opened the doors to Canada's first field hospital. The patient rooms were made up of white, plastic tented walls, numbered 1 through 100. We were all strangers, together in a strange place. We began to fill the beds with COVID-positive patients who arrived to us by bus from their nursing homes. For some, this would be a temporary stay. What we experienced within the walls of the field hospital is like nothing I've ever experienced before in my career as a nurse. I held the hand of someone's mother 
as she took her last breath. I hugged someone's child as they were missing home. I sang happy birthday to someone's grandfather as he turned 93. Some family members said their goodbyes as we held the phone to their loved one's ear. Time of death, 01.35. Hanging up the phone was the hardest part. As the second wave approached, I accepted a position in the intensive care unit. I looked into one room from outside the double closed isolation doors. She was scared. She did not want to die. Fear filled her eyes and she knew that she was getting worse. She remained positive and hopeful despite her greatest fear. I dialed her daughter's phone number, knowing this might be the last time she will get to speak with her. My heart broke as I saw her picture in the obituaries the next morning. After a devastating year, I saw a glimmer of hope as I rolled up my left sleeve and was injected with the vaccine. I am getting this vaccine to protect myself, my family, my coworkers, and our community. With so many uncertainties ahead, I know one thing is for certain. I will continue to work each day in honor of those lives we loved and have lost. With so many uncertainties ahead, I wonder what my life will look like in the years to come. Grace, I pray for health and happiness for all. Thank you.